he read to her. And there were really only two books, and this is why I say a 19th century American education. There were really only two books in most homes in America at that time, because books were expensive in the second half of the 19th century and in the early 20th century. Books were expensive. And so what were those books? The King James Version of the Bible and the complete works of William Shakespeare. And so they read to each other. And as I be, got older, she encouraged me to read those books. And, and the thought behind having those two books and why those two books is because most people felt, and I continue to agree, that most of the wisdom that you need is in those two books. <laughs> they really are. And they're both well written, too. And so, it, so, so she had a rote memory, and an amazing rote memory. And she could, you know, rattle off one of Shakespeare's soliloquies. She she could spout, you know, a Psalms. She was she was she was pretty amazing. And she so she sort of got me hooked on the printed word at a very early age. And I always thought it was you know important for me to someday be a writer for her, but I also knew I wanted to be a lawyer. And I, so so those two things sort of worked together. Uh, but where she gave me a sense of perspective, uh, my, my father had passed away, my three siblings had married, so it was just her and I t together a lot when I was home from college, just the two of us. And she's discussing with me her childhood, those uh, 11 years where it was just her and her father. And she's talking about a home in which there's no electricity, a home in which there's no indoor plumbing, uh, the water is, you know, crank the pump and fill up a pail. Um, baths were, you know, maybe once a month. Uh, you know, he heat up a bunch of water and sit in the tub and wash yourself off. And you needed to relieve yourself. You had to go outside to, to an outhouse. And really cold nights, there was a bedpan under the bed. So you didn't have to go stumbling in the dark. And, you know, it gives you a real perspective on, you know, how different life once was in this country versus what it is today. And she gets up, we're sitting in the kitchen talking. She gets up and she shuts off the light. She turns it back on. She shuts off the light. And this is after she's telling me how she read Shakespeare by a kerosene lamp. And she sits back down and she says, a lot of things have to go right for those lights to come on. And if they don't, you're gonna be fumbling in the dark for matches. And she then said, the more complicated us, and this has stayed with me, I mean, I was like 19 or so, uh, 20 when she said this, the more complicated a society, the more vulnerable it is. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine what she would think of today's society mm -hmm. with our dependence upon, you know, the internet and Wi-Fi connections and all those things, because if the electricity ever does go out for any length of time, we're going to really be scrambling, period. You know, we're going to, we would have big problems. Uh, but I always, always felt like I needed to write a book. And when I got to college, uh, I was a Protestant in a Catholic university, which, which really didn't bother me at all because there really wasn't, really, you know, religion wasn't shoved down your throat at all. It was a very serious school and I was very happy to be there. But I did get, interest in one religious thinker, St. Augustine, because I found that St. Augustine really had a keen perspective on human nature. He really understood human nature, and, and his book, The City of God, really captured me. And I, and I said, you know, somebody ought to write a book on St. Augustine's political philosophy. And then I became impressed with Machiavelli, the guy who wrote The Prince. Uh, and I, you know, but he's interesting. But I get married, I start practicing law, uh, I get elected to the, to the Freeholder Board, which is now the County Commissioners, a, a couple times. Uh, I run for the Assembly in 1979. I lose. A friend that I had made during that campaign, a gentleman who was City Councilman in Atlantic City, Peter Hollingsworth, says to me, how would you like to be Planning Board Attorney? And I'm like, that sounds terrific. <laughs> I figured this would be a lot of fun, okay? Uh, and so around the same time that I take on that position, I'm coming to the realization that you ain't ever going to write a book on St. Augustine because you don't read Latin well enough. 
And you're never going to write a book on Machiavelli because you don't read Old Italian because he wrote in Old Italian. If you, I mean, translations are translations. You, you really do need to read original works of things. And I'll explain to you more about that as I go forward. So I gave up on Augustine. I mean, I haven't given up on Augustine. He's still one of the great thinkers of all time. And I gave up on Machiavelli. And, and every now and then I meet people who I think, you know, they sort of bring the two together. And they're, they, those are really complicated people. And I've met people like that, or researched people like that. Not met people, researched people like that. Uh, so around that time that I'm you know, struggling with the fact that I'm not going to write a book on on St. Augustine or Machiavelli, I began representing the planning board. And I went into City Hall knowing it was corrupt. That didn't bother me because I had confidence that I, could, I knew how to keep a distance and I had to insulate myself. Uh, and, you know, and I would tell some of the planning staff, you've got to write a memo on that one, you had a conversation, memorialize it, don't, don't lose that. And, and when indictments came, some of the people that I advised where you know they, they had their memos that they took to the grand jury and read from, and they were fine. You know, and, and those that weren't smart enough to do it had problems of their own. Uh, and so, I'm representing the planning board, and I'm spending a lot of time in city hall. And I said, you know, the corruption doesn't bother me because that that's the norm here. But the dysfunctionality makes me crazy. Why can't they get anything done? And so, because of my experience with my mother and books and libraries and she instilled in me the belief that if you want to know something you want to you want to seek the answer to something you need to go wow good evening good evening sir great, great to see you I just happened to read the Gazette and knew you were here I'm <laughs> delighted to see you my, this is a long friend of mine Bill Duffy uh, and, and so around around the time that I'm like mentally giving up on a couple issues and I'm trying to make sense of Atlantic City uh, I go to the library because that's the they, they, have, they will have the answer you know? so I, I have the good fortune of meeting two women Jane Spittler and Marie Boyd and, and I love them both they're both long long gone but they're but lovely women and I told them my dilemma. One of them was really politically savvy, uh, and the other one was very historically savvy. And so they started feeding me books. And after about a year and a half, and I've read close to 20 books, I come, I come with three takeaways. I said, first, nobody has written a complete history of the town. All of these books are like, like you know, wedges out of a pie. Nobody wrote the whole pie. I mean, there are books on the boardwalk, books on the hotels, books on Atlantic City as a trial town for Broadway, books on Atlantic City vaudeville shows, books on midget wrestling, books on fire <laughs> companies, uh, books on schools, uh, books on Miss America, uh, books on rolling chairs, uh, I mean, a lot of books, okay, about a lot of different subjects. But I said, nobody had ever tied it all together. That's pretty amazing, okay? The next thing that i realized that and i and, and i know my dates are safe so I, 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 I really did my research on that one uh between 1880 and 1930 more than 90 percent of the hotel workforce was african-american so if you remove the african-american experience from atlantic city's history the town never comes to be what is it i don't know brigantine seattle city but it's not a resort that could host a third of a million people during the first two decades of the 20th century and the last decade of the 19th century, impossible without that workforce. And then the third thing that really impressed me was the failure to talk about corruption. Uh, because none of the books really dealt with corruption. And, and when you found newspaper articles, it was always through rose-colored glasses. You know? and, and, and what I learned was that corruption in Atlantic City, in old Atlantic City, and people will argue today too, but corruption in the old Atlantic City was organic. It was perfectly natural and it was necessary. If you have a 12, 10, 14 day window in which to host visitors, you have to give them what they want. And so before prohibition, there was bishop's laws. After prohibition, it was a, it was a crazy place. 
Um, but when the people who came to town, they needed to be, they, they needed to leave happy. I mean, what we, every business, the success of every business is repeat business. Uh, and so Atlantic City understood, and, and, and in the very beginning of Boardwalk Empire, I quote, uh, an old lawyer that I had become friendly with, Murray Fredericks, and he was the lawyer for the organization, for Hap Farley's organization, Murray Fredericks. And I was pressing him on why is Atlantic City so corrupt? And his response was if the people who came to town had wanted Bible readings, we'd have given them that. <laughs> but nobody ever asked for Bible readings. They wanted booze, board, and gambling, so that's what we gave them. And so corruption was necessary because to give, to give booze, board, and gambling, you have to bend the law. And so this guy, that's, that's, that's the cover of Boardwalk Empire. Let's go to the next one. This guy was an amazing guy. Uh, no relation. I wish he was, because if he was, I, I, would, I would have had more stories about him. Uh, yeah. But Nucky Johnson wore two hats the way nobody else I know of in 20th century American history was able to wear two hats. He was a serious player in organized crime. And he was a serious player in Republican politics in New Jersey and, and to some extent in national politics at conventions and whatnot. Uh, he was able to make deals with somebody we're going to talk about in a second, a guy named Frank Haig. And the two of them together could pretty much get their way in picking who was going to be the next governor. And they did that, they did that for quite a while. Uh, and Nucky. As I said, he, he had a foot in, in the legitimate world of politics. He had a foot in the world of organized crime. Uh, and he, he, he really understood how to organize things. He, he was an organizer. Uh, the guy who preceded him, the Commodore, was, a, was sort of a boss, but he, did, he had no sense of organization. Johnson had a true organization. Uh, and. So I'm reading all this, and, 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 I had, and, and when I understood he had gone to jail, and, and the reasons he had gone to jail, I said, I have to get my hands on the FBI transcript uh, of, the, of, the, of the record, of the, the investigation. And it took me quite a while to get it, because it was before the Freedom of Information Act, and I, and, and I, had, and I had to reach out to Bill Bradley, who was senator at the time, and I had gotten to know him when uh, he came to Hamilton to campaign. And so he, he got the FBI to, to release the report to me. And it just made my head explode when I, when I read the report. Because you've got this team of investigators coming to town, and they're talking about how wide open the town is and how confident they are they will get, be able to get indictments within six months. It took them six years. Uh, and why? Because nobody would talk. People would rather go to jail than talk against Nucky. Well, they eventually got Nucky on tax evasion, and, and, and he, he went to jail. And so the, the book on Boardwalk Empire does what it does. I mean, I, I, what inspired me to finish the book and push it, because I knew, I knew Nucky was fit for film. I, I just knew he was a character that they, somebody would do, want to do something with. And it's a very long story short. My daughter was living in LA. Uh, my nephew was living in LA. I would fly out for pitch festivals. You know, they would pick me up at the airport. And I would pitch the books, and I got, and I, and I had the good fortune of meeting a gentleman who said, you know, when I was a kid, we used to vacation in Atlantic City. He was, he was, he was from Patterson, and he said, I could always tell when my father's business was doing well, we would go for two weeks, and when his business wasn't doing so well, we only went for one week. But we always stayed at the same kosher hotel, uh, and so he, he asked for several copies of the book. I gave them to him. He spread the books around, and about. Three months after that meeting, I get a phone call from an agent, and everything just goes goes from there. And, and you know the rest of the it's a TV series. Um, this book, The North Side, I knew I had to write it because I knew the indispensable role, and I also knew I had to write it because I knew I would be able to write it. Uh, the gentleman who wrote the preface to this book, Clement Price was asked by a reporter friend of mine from the Newark Star Ledger to read the book as a, to see if he wanted would write a preface for, for the book. Uh, he, Clement Price was an African-American scholar at Rutgers. He was, he was state historian up until the time he died. Uh, 
and so Clement writes the book, I mean, re reads the book. Clement agrees to do a preface to the book. Uh, I have breakfast with him and my friend Mark, the, the reporter, uh, in Newark one morning, and I'm walking into the restaurant, and, and I could see Mark saying to Clement, here he comes, and he stands up and he says to me, I thought you were African American. He said, Nelson Johnson. He said, you read and write like a black man. And so we had a really long talk, and I explained to him, you know, about my mother's roots and about my, you know, that whole sort of thing. And he was like, "That's okay. Now I now I understand things a little bit better." But so so and he he was a wonderful man, died of a stroke, un unfortunately. Uh, but I but I tell people, Boardwalk Empire was not rejected a hundred times, but it was rejected about seventy times. You know, it got to the point where my secretary and I just lost track. And we no longer saved, saved rejection letters. Uh, and so it really is about persistence. But again, I saw how persistent my mother was in her life and the things she had to overcome and me, and me being in college when my father passes away and her and I sitting down and she's saying to me, you're going to work every summer and I'm going to work every day and I'm going to put away money and you're going to put away money. But when you go to school, your full-time job is to be a student. That is your job and you must apply yourself. And I did, you know, and, and everything, everything worked out well. I wound up uh, going over law school on a scholarship and then things, things worked out well. Uh, but let's go to the next slide. What really kept me going in the, in the writing of the North Side was, was this gentleman's history. Claiborne Morris Cade, his personal life and my personal life were so similar uh, and, they, and they were similar in this regard. His family had to make big sacrifices for him to get an education. And for him and for me, there really was no margin for failure. I mean, how the hell do you go home and tell your mother you failed out of school? I mean, how do you, how, how do you tell her you didn't do your very best? You know, when she's doing everything for you. And so, you know, and, and he went, and I, I had the good fortune of, of, of Getting my hands, I have my friend Ralph Hunter to thank for this, and I think I mentioned, I have my friend Ralph Hunter to thank for that. Uh, basically, his estate papers, amazing letters and telegrams, and, and, and he, was an ex he was an extraordinary person, but he was my, he's what made me say, you've got to write this book. And so, so I, I wrote the book, and let's go to the next one. Now, when I'm researching when I'm researching uh, Boardwalk Empire, I come across the relationship between Nucky Johnson and this guy on the left, Frank Haig. Frank Haig was mayor of Jersey City and the most powerful person in New Jersey for about 25 years. The guy with him is Arthur Vanderbilt, who was a very successful lawyer from Newark. He was a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. Back in those days, and I'm talking now the 20s and the 30s, the populations of Essex County and Hudson County were more than a third of the state's population. And so if those two counties could agree, they could pretty much get anything they want. But those two guys could not agree. And when I'm researching Boardwalk Empire, I see Johnson's relationship with Haig. Haig was a Democrat. Johnson was a Republican. They would help one another in the, this is before the laws that prevented people from crossing over and voting in the other party's primary. Those laws didn't come into existence about the 50s or the 60s. So back in the 10s, the 20s, and the 30s, if you were registered to vote and you showed up, you could vote whatever primary you, you wanted to vote, okay? So there were times when Johnson would have Republican voters in South Jersey vote in a Democratic primary to help Haig with his candidate. And there was just the opposite one time when Walter Edge, you ever went as ACC's campus, Walter Edge Hall? Well, Walter Edge was elected governor twice. And the first time he got elected, he won the Republican primary in Hudson County by more than 3,000 votes. And there weren't that many Republicans in Hudson County because everybody was Democrat. And, that, and I say everybody was Democrat because what was going on during Haig's reign was a religious war. You had the Irish Catholics who had had, had their face rubbed in the dirt so bad by the, by, the, by the Protestant wasps that 
Haig said, it's payback time. And so Haig spent most of his career making, making the, Republic, the Republicans pay for it. He was, Haig was a tough, tough sucker. But I'm reading about him when I'm reading Boardwalk Empire, and I said, hmm, yeah, hmm, this guy's an interesting guy. And I said, you know, when you were in college, you read a couple chapters in a book called, um, come on, what's the title of the book? Uh, the Boss, The Hague Machine in Action. That was the, t that was the title of the book. Uh, and I would, you know, stuck in my brain this guy Haig, and then I'm reading about him, and I'm reading about Johnson, and how the two of them would, you know, play, play votes with one another. And so then on her 60th birthday, we, we take a trip to uh, Sicily, which is where a good portion of her family's from, my wife Joanna, my bride. And I take this book with me about this guy, Arthur Vanderbilt. It's written by his grandson. His grandson's a pretty accomplished historian, and he's a, and he's a pretty decent writer. But I'm reading the book, and Haig comes up in the book, and I say to myself, he missed the, he, he, I'm sorry, he missed the story. Because the story was a conflict between those two guys, okay? So then I said, hey, then maybe, then maybe that's a book. And I start researching and blah, 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 blah. Long story short, I get a book. Rutgers agrees to publish it. Uh, Rutgers and I could not agree upon the title. I thought the title should be Street Fight, because that's really what it was. Uh, <laughs> but that wasn't, that wasn't an academic type, type title. Uh, and so it, it became Battleground, New Jersey. But I, I've had a lot of fun with that book. Uh, the Chief Justice has basically told all the judges, you need to read this book. You need to understand how we got to where we are. Because New Jersey judiciary is very respected throughout the country. We are, we are a role model and a trendsetter, for, and we're innovators. And if it wasn't for Arthur Vanderbilt, we wouldn't be that. I mean, he's, he really was persistent. Uh, his problem was he didn't know how to compromise. He just wanted to fight. And it took a guy from Haddonfield, Alfred Driscoll, who got elected governor in 1946. And he, and he, again, he looked at the landscape and he said, let's make a deal with Haig. He's got all these votes and we can, and we can get a referendum passed if we just get him on our side. And, and Driscoll did make a deal. And, and Vanderbilt was upset about making a deal with the likes of Frank Haig, but Vanderbilt went on to become the first Chief Justice and, and was a very good first Chief Justice and, and did some very important things for the court system. And, and I continue to have tremendous re re respect for him. Yeah, let's go to, that's Arthur Vanderbilt. Uh, he, he, he was nationally known as a judicial reformer but he couldn't get reform in his own state. It really made him crazy. Uh, she and I spent a weekend in Connecticut at Wesleyan University, and I went through all his files and some of the letters you know, that, that he saved and wrote. I mean, he had hundreds of folders. Uh, but I had a roadmap from his grandson as to which ones I should be looking at, and, and, and it was good. It was good. But uh, he was obsessed with reform, but he couldn't get reform in his own state. So it, and it took it took a younger, uh, less experienced politician who knew how to compromise to, to make it all happen. Let's go to the next one. And this is Frank Haig. Uh, Frank Haig was born on the kitchen table uh, in, a, in, a, in a row house in Jersey City. He was kicked out of school for being incorrigible in the sixth grade. Uh, he went on to be uh, head janitor at City Hall. From there, he got elected to the city commission. From there, he became mayor, and he became he was mayor for the next thirty plus years. Frank Haig and Arthur Vanderbilt. They were both they were both very similar in this regard. You were either attracted to them or you were repelled from them. They, there was like the, they, they were the kind of people that you either you know, were excited by their energy, or you were turned off by it. And Haig, Haig was, Haig, Haig was a real tough sucker. And what I mean by that, I met this, I, but one of the great things about doing research and going to libraries and, and meeting people is you run into people that I call folk historians. And these are guys that are like curators. They have their own little museums, and they collect books, and they collect news articles, and they interview people. They, and, and they just do it for their own personal satisfaction. So I'm in the Jersey City Library, and the librarian says to me, you want, you want to meet Frank Lynch? You think he's coming in today? So I'm meeting Frank Lynch, and I met with him a couple times after that. 
And he proceeded to tell me a story that his father told him, which was this somewhere Frank Haig is in his 50s, 52, 53, I'm not sure. He wasn't 60, but somewhere in his 50s, he's having a conversation. His father's in this, in this same meeting. He's having a conversation with somebody, and the conversation does not go well. Haig gets up, and this guy in his 50s. Haig gets up, and the other guy's in his 50s. Hey, gets up and punches the guy right in the face and knocks him out of his chair. I mean, that's how aggressive Frank Hay was. And he, and, he, and he was a very shrewd tactician politically. It was it, the power that he, was, he accrued and had doing. And here's the, here's the amazing thing about him, and, and please take this the right way. Like Hap Farley, they never were able to indict him. They were never able to charge him with anything. I mean, as corrupt as they both were, they were that smart that they knew how to stay out of the stay out of the clutches of the law, uh, and you, and you have to respect that. I mean, whether you like it or not, you have to respect that shrewdness, that ability to manipulate other people, that you know you control your world and you do the things you want, and legally you never have to pay for it, you know, because they're, they were that shrewd, they were that smart, and so so I. I, I I admire Frank Hague a great deal. Do I like him? No. <laughs> but uh, do I admire him and respect him? Yeah, because he, you know, he, he was anything but warm and fuzzy. But, but an amazing character to research about. Now this guy, Clarence Darrow, this gentleman gave me a copy of uh, Irving Stone's book, Darrow for the Defense, many years ago. I have it at home still. And I was going to bring this book to you, and I haven't had a chance yet. This book's your son. Any event, Bill Duffy and I go way back. Uh, I'm really happy you're here. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, at the age of five, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. I'm, I'm, I'm in a car with my father and my grandfather, and I'm talking, and my grandfather says, Nelson, you talk so much, you should be a lawyer. And I said, what's a lawyer? When he had this answer, he could have he said anything. <laughs> A lawyer is someone who helps people when they're in trouble. Well, my mother had always taught me that the reason we exist is to help one another. Because why else do we exist if we're not here to help one another? You know, it doesn't make any sense to fight with one another. And so I said, hmm, that's interesting. So I went home, you know, I asked my mother, what's, what, what's a lawyer do? Uh, and she explained, and then by the time I was in my third grade, I had been to visit Vince DeMarco's office, and by the time I was in the fifth grade, I had sat in municipal court and watched things go on, uh, and you know, that's it, you know. But I really did have a very uncomplicated life, because think about it, no decisions, hmm. no anxiety, no worries. You just know what you're gonna do, and, and, and you do it. And I had the good fortune of being able, being able to do that. Uh, and so, this guy, I read about him when I'm like 13 years old. I read, I read a paperback version. Bill, Bill gave me a hard copy. Uh, a paperback version of uh, Darrow for the Defense by Irving Stone. Uh, when Joanne and I go to Washington the Library of Congress to research, we find that Stone's book was in very large part written based upon his wife Ruby's letters because Ruby uh, was a journalist uh, who gave up her career to support the man that she thought would become the most famous lawyer in American history, and she was right. Uh, let, let's go to the next one with Darrow. Clarence was an amazing self-promoter. He, he, he had some really big cases that got national recognition. Uh, you may have heard of Leopold and Loeb, the two teenagers who, who murdered a young boy. You may have heard of the Scopes monkey trial on, dev, on evolution. Uh, there was a movie called Inherit the Wind, starring Spencer Tracy. Uh, but what had always interested, let's, let's go to, and this is Ruby. What most historians don't appreciate is Darrow was brilliant as hell, but eccentric as hell. And so if you gave him a really interesting book and he sat down in that chair, he might stay there until he finished it. And you'd be turning out the lights, and he'd be saying, "What's going on?" You know, uh, he, he was—he he could get disconnected from the world. And Ruby was sort of the one who, you know, winded him up and pointed him in the right in the right direction because 
scheduling train trips, scheduling hotels, uh, you know, getting him to the barber. Uh, he, 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 did, he did not care about the little things of life. He was just focused on the big issues. Truth, truth is, and this is something that a lot of biographers gloss over, he really wasn't all that keen on the law, the law, the law. He was, he was keen on the battle. He always wanted to fight for the underdog. He always wanted to fight for the, for the person who was, who was being, being kicked. And what, let's go to the next slide. What happens, and we're gonna talk about him in a quick, but, but what happens is I, I, got, I got interested in, there's been, there's been so many books and this, this is unusual, and, and any of you who have, have, have uh, come across these, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. There have been so many books written on Clarence Darrow and so many essays and articles that there's a published bibliography. Now, who gets bibliographies? Lincoln, the two Roosevelts, uh, you know, Jesus. I mean, I'm, 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 not being, I'm not being a smartass. I mean, for, for somebody to write a book about all the books written about you, that's a pretty big deal. She and I, it was a, it was a November day about 15 years ago. We're in, we're in, we, we, go to, we go to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And it's a rainy day. And it was a wonderful, the Coopers, if you've ever been, to, if you've ever been there, it's an amazing place. Mm -hmm. Go, Co Cooperstown is wonderful. Uh, and we find this big used bookstore. And I'm looking for a, a, a book on something on Greek history. And she's just looking for books. And the next thing I, and she knows, and she knows I'm thinking about Dara at the time. And she comes up to me and she says, mm -hmm. there's a bibliography on the life of Clarence Darrow. Blew my mind. So obviously we bought that. And it was a good source in terms of finding all the books that had been written about him. And what I, you know, what I learned, I probably read about 15 books on Darrow, and there's been a lot more. But, but first of all, nobody appreciated how eccentric he was, and nobody appreciated that they didn't want to talk about the fact that the law didn't interest him as much as the fight interested him. And so Darrow becomes the champion of the labor movement at the end of the 19th century, uh, and he's, he's representing the coal miners, he's rep representing the, the gold miners, the silver miners, he's representing the iron workers, he, he's representing the, the, the brand new uh, AFL before it became the FAL-CIO, the first was the American Federation of Labor, head by Samuel Gompers. Uh, so he, he's, he's representing them, and this, is, this has become his career for about 20 years, and how he got there is a whole other story. But, for about 20 years, he's representing the labor movement, and th those, they are his clients. And in 1910, after he had represented a guy named Big Bill Haywood, who was one of the miners' union people charged with murder, I mean, it was three years, three different trials involving different people, and he was totally exhausted. In October of 1910, this gentleman's newspaper, the Los Angeles Times, is exploded. And I mean exploded in a very big way. The jackass, one of the McNamara brothers, put the dynamite next to barrels of ink. He didn't know they were barrels of ink. He thought he was just going to set off a noisy explosion that might put a dent in one of the walls. He, he set off an explosion that started a huge fire, set the whole building on fire. The printing press caves through the floor hits a gas main, there's another, another explosion, 20 people die, and they arrest the two brothers after a, after a six month manhunt. And so the labor movement comes to Chicago and says to Darrow, you need to represent the brothers. And he doesn't want to, and, and Ruby doesn't want him to do it either. I mean, she, she, Ruby was really vehement, you know, look, he's paid his dues, let somebody else do this, Get, find another lawyer. They, they didn't care. They just leaned on him until he said yes. So he goes there, and everybody BSs him because the labor movement knew that the brothers had done this. Okay, uh, but the but the but the but they wanted Darrow to defend them, get them acquitted, and vindicate the labor movement. Okay, he's there about two three months, and he says they're guilty. Well, I can't do anything to save them. Uh, and the, and the guy who was handling the case was a candidate for California Supreme Court. He would have loved nothing more than to hang these two brothers. 
And so Darrow, who was very much opposed to the uh, death penalty, Darrow, with the help of a guy named Lincoln Steffens, who was the first muck, muckraking journalist in, in history and a, and a brilliant guy and respected by a lot of people for his work, and they negotiated a plea bargain. Not long after the plea bargain is negotiated, Darrow is charged with a crime himself. Now, why did I have his picture up here? I have his picture up here because he absolutely hated Clarence Darrow. And I, he wanted Clarence Darrow in jail. And so, how did the indictment come about? We're never really going to know that. Okay, the, the, the indictment was for the attempting to bribe a juror. A juror who had yet to be called for jury selection, because in those days, jury selection could go on a long time, and it was a murder trial involving two brothers, and you know, very controversial case. And so the process was going on and on and on. And one of the people who was part of the jury pool, but never called, supposedly was bribed, okay? Uh, was he, you know, did, did Jarrow you know, work behind the scenes to try to bribe this guy? I don't think so, because there was so much money involved, and Darrow was so tight with a buck. It was hard to believe that you know, Darrow was about. But any event, a book that I came across who focused on this trial found that Darrow was guilty. I mean, this is what the author said. Darrow was guilty. Even though he was acquitted, Darrow was guilty. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm not buying that. You know, as, a, as, a, as a lawyer and as a judge, jury verdicts are supposed to mean something. And you know, it bothered me. So I'm, I'm reading the book, and I'm looking to what are you citing when you're saying these different things about what happened at trial? And he's citing newspaper articles. Who were, there were 12 newspapers in Los Angeles at the time, two Sundays and 10 dailies. But do you think everybody had their own angle? Because I, I represented the newspaper for years, the press. And, I, and two different reporters could see things completely differently. And especially when you start talking about a trial, you're talking about lay people talking about things that they may not even appreciate what they're looking at. And so, very long story short, going back to my mother's love for libraries and getting me, you know, my library card when I was four years old, you know, I find a librarian, University of Minnesota Law School, and became friendly with him. Had said we've had several conferences and on the phone and, and going back and forth in email, and he says to me, I got access to the trial transcript of Darrow's trial, where, you know, where he, he was charged with attempting to bribe a juror. I said, well, you know I want to read it. His response was, do you realize what you're doing here? And I said, well, tell me. He said, it's 90 volumes, and it's more than 8,000 pages. The trial was 12 weeks long. I said, well, I'm not going to know if I like it until I start it. So, <laughs> so, so you know, I didn't, get, I didn't get it in paper. He, he had gotten a grant, he had gotten it digitized, and so I was able to download, took, took my secretary a better part of that. The da the, no, I was not able, she was able to download these 90 things. You know, and so I begin reading them, I'm, in a, I'm an early riser. Um, so I dedicated from 4.30 to 6.30 in the morning to begin <coughs> reading them and making, and making notes before I went to the courthouse. And I had to continue continue that, you know, after I was off the bench, and it was such an exciting read for somebody like me, because I, I could see what was going on in the courtroom, and, and, and the, the judge was a really nice man, and I think he was bright, but when I researched him, his background was in Western water rights, he had no experience in criminal law, and let's go to the next slide. And this guy, and, and, and it's not like I didn't discover this guy. This guy is in the Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame. This is Earl Rogers. Earl Rogers was a legal genius. See, Darrow was in a strange land with a bunch of strangers. He needed to have local counsel. Ruby didn't like this guy because Ruby's attitude was he's, so much, he's too much of a showman. And, 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 he, and he was a bit of a showman. I mean, look, look at the way he's dressed. Uh, Gary Cooper, Clark, Clark Gable, sought out his tailor because he dressed so well. But if you understand him and if you read what his daughter, his daughter wrote an wrote a extensive, his daughter won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, his daughter 
won a Pulitzer Prize, and she was a screenwriter and a journalist. Daughter was brilliant, Adela Rogers. But if you read you know, what she has to say about him, and if you read some, some of the other, there have been no good biographies on him. And I, I, I hope to do one on him, but it's not going to come together. I, mean, I was talking to a, a librarian at the Bancroft Library in California, and, and getting access to what I need for him, you just can't do it. You know, mm. It's crazy. Uh, it'll take forever, and I don't have that much patience right now. Uh, and so Darrow reaches out to Rogers and as I'm reading these 8,000 pages, it's really clear that this guy dominates the courtroom. And it's also really clear that this trial's some sort of film, some sort of movie. So, so I, I knew this as I'm reading it, just like I felt like Nucky's, is something belongs on the screen, this belongs on the screen. And so I'm, I'm reading this and I said to myself, I gotta, I gotta get a literary agent who's a lawyer. Well, I did. And then he and I huddle, and we said, we got to find a producer who's got a background in the law. And we found one. And so I don't know if he's going to be the star of the movie or if Dara's going to be the star, or Ruby's going to be the star of the movie. One of those three is going to sort of be the star of the movie. But this guy taught law to medical students, and he taught medicine to law, to legal, to law students. Uh, he was the first person, I don't know if you ever heard of the term demonstrative evidence. Demonstrative evidence is things you take into the courtroom to help explain an issue. Could be a photograph, it could be you know, a, a part of a machine. But he was doing demonstrative evidence before anybody had even thought about it. He was doing it at the turn of the 20th century. He was, he was doing demonstrative evidence. He was bringing skeletons into the courtroom. He was bringing bones. Uh, he was doing accident reconstruction. He was doing crime scene reconstruction. He was doing blow-ups of big photos. He used, he used exhibits in Darrow's trial. And I get this one crude photo of, of, of the exhibits hanging up on the wall uh, behind the jury. But he basically took control of the courtroom because he knew the law better than anybody else in the courtroom, including Darrow, and including the judge. And the, and the, and the two adversaries, the, 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 the district attorney and assistant district attorney, they were a pair of politicians, basically. One of them was a good lawyer. The other one was a politician who eventually ran for governor and lost because he made a fool of himself in this trial. I mean, he, he attacked one of the co-counsel with an inkwell and all sorts of crazy things went on in this trial. I mean, and it was really a lot of fun to read, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to write. But this guy, uh, he may be the star of the movie or whatever. I'm not sure. It, it, he's he's an amazing character. Sad thing, and, and I have to have to I have to tell you this. It's a bit of a downer. Uh, he he was he was bipolar, I think, in a day when nobody was being diagnosed for that because nobody even thought of these issues and so he medicated with booze and at the age of 52 he told his daughter I can't do this anymore and he went and drank himself to death quite literally drank, drank himself to death uh, but left behind an extraordinary legacy because he handled so many trials in his day and he was so successful and I tell people as much as I admire Clarence Darrow if you remove Earl Rogers, I don't know. Darrow could have been convicted in that in that trial because they wanted him bad. They wanted they wanted him so bad that they charged him with another person. And there was there was a second trial. There's no transcript of that, and I think the reason the Los Angeles County Bar didn't bother to save another long transcript is because the testimony was all the same. And that trial was a hung jury. And Rogers was sick and wasn't in much of the trial. And so if, you know, I'm saying to myself, if Rogers isn't around in that first trial, they could have convicted him. Uh, and we might never even know who Clarence Darrow was. Uh, I don't think Darrow was guilty. Some people think that he was. I really don't think he was guilty. Uh, but we're never really going to know uh, because every, everybody's dead. And you know, the only evidence left remaining is the 8,000-page trial transcript that I read. And, uh, Makes, makes him look innocent to me. I mean, when you, when you see how Rogers presents the case, it, it's fascinating. So uh, that's my latest work. I got two other books that I'm on a path towards trying to figure out 
which one I want to write next, uh, making her a little bit crazy in, the, in that process because she has to hear about this one, she has to hear about that one. Uh, but I'll get there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll figure it out. Uh, but I'm honored to have the opportunity to address you. So, okay. any questions? I'm I'm game for questions. Yes. Want to know who's going to write the book about you? Because <laughs> <laughs> there will be one. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Better not be her. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a uh, was Earl Rogers a doctor? That became a lawyer, or a lawyer that became a doctor. He was a he's a he was a Presbyterian minister's son, who started out his career as a journalist, with the L, not with the L.A. Times, but with with one of the competing papers in Los Angeles, and he got he got frustrated and took law courses. In those days, you didn't you didn't have to graduate from law school, but you had to sit for the law in another lawyer's office, and then you were examined orally, and then told if you were eligible. But, but he, he, was, he, he had a fascination with anything that he thought might help a client. He, he, he really was very devoted to the law and, and extremely devoted to his client once he undertook, a, undertook representation. And he, 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 he how do I say this? He was a genius. I have no doubt about that. And he was a genius attracted to the law because as a newspaper reporter, he covered trials. And he said, hey, I can do that. And that's, you know, that's how. And, and, the, and, the, and I discuss it in the book. One of the really sad sub-stories in this book is that he had a friend. It was, it was. This gentleman's mom and his mom were friendly, and he was, he was a lot younger than Rogers. He had a friend who was, who was working for the LA Times, and, and, and Rogers would work late hours. His office was right across the street from the LA Times, and this young man would you know, bring sandwiches or whatever, and they would talk in the evening, and Rogers would talk to him about how you interview somebody and get them to trust you. Because see, here's what I learned from representing the Atlantic City Press for 20 years. Reporters and lawyers are a lot alike because they've got to get people to trust them before they'll communicate honestly. And Rogers was sort of the coach to this, to this young man, and he was one of the 20 people who died. And so it was a really bitter pill. For Rogers was, was not pro-labor, he was not anti-labor. He understood labor's griefs and but for him to take on that case after his friend had died, for me, showed a great deal of professionalism that he could just see past that. And like, I got a client to represent, and, and I'm, this guy's being screwed, and I got to help him. But now Rogers, Rogers uh, was the son of a Presbyterian minister who, be, who had, I think he had a couple years of college at Syracuse, uh, and then the family moved west. He became a reporter, and then he studied law, and he became a lawyer in his 20s and, and, and did have an amazing career. He really did before he drank himself to death. Thank you. To make up more than you wanted, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I mean, also, just a comment. Say, growing up, uh, regarding your family, everybody loved Jenny. Uh, my mother was an amazing woman. Uh, I don't know how many people in here ever got to know her, but uh, uh, she was really special in her own way. And what I mean by that is, uh, there wasn't a mean bone in her body. Uh, that would, would forgive anybody for anything. Uh, and when my father died, uh, she did not take a vacation until I graduated from law school. She worked six days a week in the hardware store uh, because you gotta get this done. I was, you know, I was, I was, I was the, I was the one she was determined. See, she was forced to leave school when she was 16. Then her father died, and she came and lived in Hamilton. And so, education was really precious to her, and it was important to her that I get my education. And once she knew what I wanted, she said, "Well, seven years, and we're just gonna have to, we're just gonna have to stay at it until we get it done." But she would not let me work. 
She was, and I did work hard during the summers, hanging guard rail, <laughs> okay, with Whitmire's and then statewide. Uh, her attitude was, your job is to be a student full time, and that's what I want you to do. Uh, and I did it. And her attitude was, I'll stay at this until you're educated, and then I'll start taking vacations. And she didn't take any vacations until, but I'll tell you, I'll digress. To answer his question, I'll digress. This will tell you about my mother. 1972, I ran for school board. 1972. 1972. I'm, 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 anybody remember Donald Crescenzo, David's father? Okay, well, he was my dentist. And I'm, and I'm sitting in his chair. He has his hands in my mouth. And he tells me his former dental partner, Dan Battieri, had been on the school board, and Dan died of cancer. And there was a, a vacancy for a one-year slot, slot. And he says to me, "You ought to, you ought to run for school board." And I'm like, "Really? Yeah." yeah. <laughs> and 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 he starts give me a sales pitch on why I ought to, ought to run for school board. Now, anybody remember that before 1972, we had had four failed referendums in this town, and kids were going to school in double session. Her brother was going to school in the dark. You know, like seven o'clock in the morning, uh, and then kids were going home in the dark. Uh, where was your brother's class in the Masonic Hall? No, he was in the, the lower part of the old building that John oh, grew. From but, fourth grade to eighth grade, he never he was on half sessions for those four oh, years. Eight, for four years, he was on half session. Okay. Uh, because some went to school early in the morning and some went to school in the afternoon into the early evening. And so Donald Crescenzo was telling me, you ought to run for school board. Uh, so I do, and, and I get elected for that, that first one year term and then I got elected after that for another year term. So it's like 1973, we are now pushing for a new school, another referendum, hoping, hopefully this time we're gonna succeed. And so we had this big public hearing in the uh, auditorium at the at the uh, high school because we're you know the, because I, the high school that I graduated from on Liberty Street because we're trying to uh, get a referendum passed for the elementary school which is on Fourth Street now. All right. Two of the speakers that stand that get up to talk in support of the referendum are sitting very close to each other. One's Pete Marinelli, everybody that man, a couple of you will know who Pete is. Pete, Pete, was, Pete was the last justice of the peace in Hamilton under the old constitution. He was a gas station owner. He was known by everybody, he was a, and he was a character too, okay? But, he was, but a wise, uneducated man, very wise, uh, and very respected. And my mother, they were, they were like two of the first people to speak in favor of him. And I'm sitting next to Donald Crescenzo, and he goes like this. He said, those two, they're worth about 400 votes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's why you wanted me to run for school board, <laughs> for my mother's votes. <laughs> okay. And we were, we were successful. We were, we were, my, my favorite, and, I'm, and now you're, gonna, you're forcing me to digress, Bill. But here's, my, here's my favorite story about my mother. Yeah, so I'll try to get through without. I'll, I'll try to. I'll try to smile about it rather than uh, cry. 1975, I run for what's now the county commissioners. My opponent is Peter Parisi, who's been mayor uh, four times in Hamilton. Uh, he's running for re-election as freeholder. Uh, I knew I could. I knew I could compete with him in Hamilton. I knew I would lose to him in Hamilton, but I knew I could compete with him in Hamilton to not get clobbered. And again, because my mother, I knew I could compete with him. She was a good campaigner, very subtle. Okay, very subtle, uh, because that's how she was. And she grew up in Newtonville, as I told you. And one of her friends in Newtonville was a gentleman named Wilder Hines. And she tells me, you ought to seek out Wilder. So I do seek out Wilder, and he and I become very friendly. And, and he, he, had, you know, he had shopped in a hardware store, and the relationship was, was still good between him and, my, him and my mom. 
Uh, and elections, and, and I proved this to a large number of people. Do you remember the ele the elect what year did Emily graduate from high school? 2005. 2005. Do you remember the referendum in 2003 for the new new high school? Um, anybody anybody remember that? Okay. I sat down with Sam Doney, who was then school board attorney, and he said to me, you know, would you help organize the, the vote? And I said yes. And I had Rick Gillespie and I had Brenda DeMarco, and we organized a really good effort. And the closer we got to the election, I started counseling people. And I'm going to explain to you why. Forget about undecided voters. Forget about people that you have to convince. We're now focusing on people who have told us they'll vote yes. And to hell with everybody else. And I want everybody to make up a list of who you know is going to vote yes. And then she has connections with the Electrical Workers Union through ACIT. They come to town. We give them the lists. And they're knocking on doors. And they're driving people to the polls. And after all that effort, we won by 23 votes. Jeez. OK? My effort running for school board a lot of years earlier, running, running, for board of, running for the Board of Freeholders a lot of years earlier, I knew that I was going to have problems because Pete Parisi and Hammond did. And my goal was to not be beat by 500 votes. My goal was to be beat by less than 500 votes. And then my goal was to beat him in Mullica Township, run neck to neck with him in, uh, in uh, Hamilton, H Hamilton Township, uh, not, be, not get beaten too bad in Buna Borough, uh, and then beat him in, in Buena Vista Township. That was my goal. Okay, so I wind up I wind up winning by 75 votes. Okay, and there was a recount and everything, but you know I wound up winning by 75. So the night of the election, we, we knew we had won, and I had I had I had focused on when I, in Buena Vista Township. I had focused on Newtonville. It's a district number four. I, can't I think I think it's still called district number four, and. Wilder had the same mindset, which is we've got to get everybody out who's going to vote for Jenny Benson's son. But that's that's how he campaigned, Jenny Benson's son. <laughs> okay, so the night the night of the election, uh, and we know we won. We're having a, this big big get together uh, at the Mount Carmel Society Hall. Uh, Ralph Fichatola was was a, was active with the society, and he was a Democrat, and so that 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 became our headquarters for the night, and. My mother's there, and she wants to see Wilder. And I'm calling Wilder, and I'm getting no answer on the phone. And so he was like me. He was an early riser. So I called him the next morning around 6.30. And I said, Wilder, where were you last night? My mother wanted to see you. And he said, I, I won Newtonville like 123 to 17, and I only won by 75 votes. So I knew, I knew where I won. I, I won there, okay? Along with other places, but you got to go to your strength. And Wilder says to me, I can't believe the 17 people who voted against Jenny Benson's son. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he was upset. <laughs> He was disappointed. He, he, I said, I said, you didn't expect a clean, a clean sweep. He said, why not? You know? <laughs> so that's that's my favorite. That's my favorite Jenny story. Uh, and I got a lot of favorite Jenny stories, but that's my that's that's probably my favorite. Any other questions? Well, okay, I talked your ear off. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I've enjoyed myself and I've enjoyed being here. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. those books uh, if anybody's interested in any of them they're, they're, it's, to keep it simple to different prices but they will all be signed each $20 you don't pay you don't pay you don't pay why no you, get, you, gave, you gave me Irving Stone's hardbound I've got about five versions of Irving Stone's book but yours is the most precious to me okay well, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.